Good evening. I am Dr. Kiva Miller, and I'm the Dean for the School of Social Work and Criminal Justice. And I have the great honor of welcoming you to today's event, Mass Shootings in the United States, What Makes Us Unique. We are so pleased you have joined us this evening at the University of Washington Tacoma to engage in an important conversation about why the United States has so many more mass shootings than any other country. As an urban serving university and school, we are committed to partnering with our community to address some of the most pressing needs in our local, national, and international communities. And I am pleased that the Violence and Prevention and Transformation Research Collaborative, also known as the VPTRC, has provided this opportunity. The VPTRC is an initiative that is housed in the School of Social Work and Criminal Justice at the University of Washington Tacoma. Its focus is the study and prevention of violence in general, but in particular, mass shootings, violence, uh, school violence, and hate crimes. The VPTRC has two main objectives, conducting groundbreaking research on the causes and prevention of various forms of violence and sharing the, this knowledge widely with scholars, practitioners, policymakers, and the public in order to make changes and reduce violence in society. This important work cannot be made possible without the support and very generous funding from two of our partners, the Koshka Foundation for Safe Schools and the Vautauer Family Foundation. Each is instrumental in supporting Dr. Eric Matvis, who is the director of the VPTRC and his work that ensures violence prevention, mass school shootings, school violence, and hate crimes remain at the forefront of practice and policy conversations both locally and nationally. I now have the great pleasure or honor, pleasure and honor, to introduce Dr. Eric Matfis, who is a professor of criminal justice at the University of Washington Tacoma in the School of Social Work and Criminal Justice. Dr. Matfis received his PhD in sociology from Northeastern University in Boston, where he was a research associate at the Brudnick Center on Violence and Conflict. His scholarly expertise is concentrated in the causes and prevention of school violence, hate crimes, and mass murders. As a recognized expert on, on school and mass shootings, he has spoken to audiences across the country and around the world, including in the United States Congress and Washington State Legislature. Dr. Maffitz often teaches courses in criminological theory, sociology of deviance and social control, criminal homicide, juvenile justice, and diversity and social justice. Dr. Maffitz's work has been disseminated in academic journals across a range of disciplines. One of his monographs entitled, How to Stop School Rampage Killing, Lessons from Averted Mass Shootings and Bombings, explores how threats of multiple victim rampage shootings are assessed and prevented in America's public schools. Relatively recently, he published an edited volume entitled All American Massacre, The Tragic Role of American Culture and Society in Mass Shootings, which examines why mass shootings occur so much more frequently in the United States than anywhere else in the world. I would also like to add that Dr. Mappas has been featured in over 75 media outlets that include national media such as the Boston Globe, NPR, Washington Post, MSNBC's, up with Chris Hayes, The New Yorker, Chicago Tribune, Politico, and HBO's last night, last week, tonight with John Oliver, as well as international media outlets such as the BBC News, Al Jazeera, El Español in Spain, the Straits Times in Singapore, Univision, and many more. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Eric Matfis, who just this morning, one last thing, one last thing, just this morning was notified that he has been selected as the 2024 Distinguished Community Engagement Award recipient at the University of Washington Tacoma. And I saved this moment to personally congratulate him. I didn't. Um, text him or I didn't email him to do that because I wanted to do it publicly. So congratulations, Eric.
Thank you. Thank you all. You got to cut that, that intro down a little bit. That's, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, start out by, by doing some um, very sincere uh, thank yous to everyone who made this event possible. Um, I particularly want to th thank uh, Stefan Vathoyer, um, Jamie Nelson, and the Vathoyer Family Foundation um, for uh, uh, allowing this work to happen um, and allowing us to, to be able to, to do these kind of um, events, um, as well as Christina anderson Frawling and the Koshka Foundation for Safe Schools, also for their generous support um, for this event and the VPTRC in general. Um, would not be possible um, without both of, uh, of, of your generous um, contributions. Uh, I do want to thank uh, Chancellor Lang and, and the Chancellor's Office for their general support um, to help us get some food as well. Um, I, I want to thank my uh, amazing and supportive Dean, uh, Dr. Cuba Miller, um, my, my research assistant, um, Katie Callahan, for her help advertising this event today. Um, and I want to say, uh, you know, you always say last but not least, but I'm going to say last um, and maybe most. I also want to thank uh, Kelly Kledzik, our, our program coordinator for the VPTRC, without whom we would not, uh, you know, have any of this. We would there be no food and, and, and no lights on or anything like that. So thanks so much um, to all these various people. And also thank you so much. Um, to our, our, our fantastic speakers um, coming as, as far as, uh, you know, Alabama and Massachusetts and, and, um, uh, and, and Washington. So coming from, from uh, you know, near and far to be with you here today. Um, and I also want to thank all of you for coming. So I really do appreciate you guys coming here and, and sitting indoors on a, on, a, on a beautiful day like today. So thank you all for being here. Um, so yeah, uh, Kiva had a, 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 Dean Miller had a nice introduction, so I'll, 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 I'll skip that, but talk about um, that, uh, you know, I, I, I've been doing this work on, on uh, mass shooting school violence um, for quite a long time, looking at a number of different uh, sort of factors and influences that, that, that impact these things, from looking at, at uh, you know, school shootings and, and, and school violence more generally, it's the it's ways that school discipline impacts the school to prison pipeline, um, school threat assessment and sort of restorative practices, uh, you know, looking at, at hate crimes and white supremacist organizations, the causes and prevention of mass shootings more broadly, um, whether that's things like, like uh, you know, gender and, and, and masculinity, sort of structural strain, um, you know, firearm access, media coverage, copycat effects, all these sort of different things. And so um, I'm, I'm happy to say with, with funding support from uh, right, the Vat Hoyer Family Foundation, the Costco Foundation for Safe Schools, um, the, the VPTRC, the Violence Prevention and Transformation Research Collaborative, is our uh, new initiative that we have in the School of Social Work and Criminal Justice that's, that's focusing on the prevention of violence broadly and specifically uh, 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 general um, uh, mass shooting, school violence, and hate crimes um, in particular. And so, um, this is sort of our, we're happy to show this is our, our, our first year in existence, um, and this is our, our second event. We had an event in, in the fall on um, sort of a more practitioner-focused event on, on school threat assessment, um, and uh, we're happy to have this broader event for you guys today. Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, what we know about mass shootings in the United States, and, and, and particularly why this is a, a uniquely American problem in some ways. Um, it's true that kind of in the last few years, really, we've, we've um, moved on from, from this sort of, really was, was a kind of heated debates, quite, quite a lot of arguments about, you know, the extent to which the United States even really had uh, more mass shootings than anywhere else, um, and, and, and sort of arguments around that to really a more broad consensus around uh, sort of all, all credible recent research that we certainly do have far more, um, you know, the greatest number and the highest share of public mass shootings across the globe. And uh, this has involved lots, lots of debate. Uh, much of it, uh, unfortunately, hindered by some, you know, ideologically motivated, you know, particular scholars sort of uh, opposed to that idea. But I think it's moved forward in, in no small part to, um, you know, uh, my colleague here, to, to talk, Dr. Adam Langford. Um, and his dedication to kind of empirically prove that. Um, and there was, you know, as a result of his uh, research, which demonstrated that this was the case, right, there was media and academic backlash um, about this, I think, fairly obvious assertion, but he persisted publishing numerous articles to prove this, uh, even, you know, uh, disproving his detractors using their own data. Um, and because of that sort of contentious debate, um, over the fact, you know, this basic question, does, does the United States have more mass shootings and this sort of being, being uh, you know, in question, 
um, and the fact that that was sort of not, not clear um, to a lot of scholars, right, there was very, very little research that really looked at why that was the case, to try to explain, um, you know, if that, if that is the case, what, what are the reasons for that? Why is, why is that true? Um, and so, uh, as a result of that, that sort of particular need, um, Dr. Langford and I were able to write, uh, to, to write this book, to edit this book um, together, um, which is the, really the first book to ever look at that, to try to understand why it is that the United States has so many more than elsewhere. So our book on, on Temple University Press here, All American Massacre, um, co-edited with, co um, with myself and, and Dr. Adam Langford. We have a, also a, a chapter um, about uh, uh, intersectionality and sort of race, class, and gender dynamics of, of the causes and sort of motivations of, of mass shootings by, by Dr. Daniel Gascon as well, another one of our speakers. And so um, this, this, this book is really and sort of it's a, a multifaceted, sort of intersectional, uh, interdisciplinary explanation as to why uh, mass shootings are so much more common in the United States than anywhere else. Um, and, you know, compared to most prior scholarship, which kind of, you know, looked at mass shootings, but uh, kind of only passing consideration of the, of the context in which it took place and understanding that, why, you know, that, that it's important to look at why it is the case that it happened in America. Was there particularly American context that helped understand that? And so why we, our contributions that we had um, was very interdisciplinary with sociologists and criminologists, psychologists, political scientists, media and education scholars, epidemiologists and historians. Um, and, and particularly a focus on exploring how American culture, institutions, and social structures influence the circumstances and frequency and severity of mass shootings in the United States. So, you know, certainly, yes, it's about easy access to guns in a country with more guns than people, which does make us unique. Um, but it's also about gun culture in a number of ways. It's also about lack of political will and, and polarization and corruption, which stagnates um, you know, common sense gun safety no laws that, that the majority of Americans, uh, vast majority agree on. Um, you know, lack of access to affordable mental health care as, as, a, as an issue. Um, in, in many respects, it is about sort of toxic forms of, of masculinity that connect gender identity to uh, guns and violence as a source of, of power or, or toughness, particularly for, for men who have, and, and boys who have felt emasculated um, throughout the course of their lives. Um, it is often about white supremacy in the United States and how that influences hate-motivated uh, mass shootings, mass shootings that are also hate crimes. Uh, it is about the media and how they often glamorize killers and how uh, media coverage can inspire contagion and copycat effects um, in people who want to become famous uh, essentially at any cost. Um, and it is about punitive and exclusionary schools and lack of social supports for those falling bet um, between the cracks. And so today's event was, uh, you know, inspired by this book and this topic. And so I'm proud to have these distinguished speakers with us discussing a range of topics, but all helping us move forward to better understand mass shootings in the American context specifically. So we'll start with uh, Dr. Adam Langford, who will, who will, will uh, I'll do longer introductions for everyone as we go. Um, we'll be talking about um, particularly uh, a lot of, uh, you know, sort of reasons why the United States has more and some of the, the, the context for that, uh, particularly around gun, uh, gun access and, and media influences. We'll have uh, Dr. Daniel Gascon, we'll talk about um, intersectionality and talk about the, the role of race, class, and gender in sort of impacting these things in the American context. And then we'll have uh, Christina Anderson Froling, um, uh, the executive director of the Koshka Foundation. Um, we'll talk about her own experiences um, as a survivor of the Virginia Tech shooting and her journey to better understand and prevent these deadly events. So um, first I just wanna say, um, we are gonna have a Q&A panel at, at, at the end. Um, so if you do have any questions, there are, is, we have no cards and we have pens there in the back if you would, if you would like any of that, feel free to write down questions as we go. Um, and uh, the other thing I'll say, we also do have uh, a couple um, of uh, books that we'll be raffling off. So if you are interested um, in getting a copy of the book, uh, if you put your name there in the back, we'll have a raffle there at the, uh, our little intermission. Uh, we'll have a break here and then you're, you'll, you'll uh, raffle up a couple uh, free copies. And we also do have some copies being sold outside as well. All right, so with that, uh, I'm gonna, uh, we'll, be, we'll begin um, and I'll introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Adam Langford here. Um, who is professor and chair of the Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice at the University of Alabama. He's the author of two books and many peer-reviewed studies on mass shooting, uh, terrorism, and other forms of criminal behavior. His findings have been published in many scientific journals and cited by the White House, by every major media outlet in the United States, and by international media from more than 40 countries. Uh, 
Uh, Dr. Langford also helped coordinate the Senior Executive Anti-Terrorism Forums for high-ranking foreign military and security personnel as part of, his, of a contract with the U.S. State Department's Anti-Terrorism Assistance Program. And in 2019, Dr. Langford received the Innovation in Research and Publication Award from the National Association for Behavior Intervention and Threat Assessment. And I'll just add that by uh, my estimation, I think Dr. Langford is, is probably the most prolific and perhaps the, the leading scholar on mass shootings in the world and, and generally a, a lovely person to work with. So uh, I, I'd like to uh, introduce you to Dr. Adam Langford, please. Okay, well, so thank you for having me. Um, you know, I'm just going to kind of delve into our subject of mass shootings in the United States, what makes us unique. And I did just kind of want to say at the outset, you know, just given the nature of what we're talking about today, I'm not anti-American and I'm not someone who gets pleasure from discussing things that are profound American problems. Um, really, you know, just the focus here is how do we make our country safer? At least that's my goal. Um, so I just wanted to kind of say that at the outset because I'm going to talk about a lot of things that really are a big American problem. Uh, I wanted to just briefly touch on definitions. Uh, so what are public mass shootings? They're what most people mean by just mass shootings. Uh, Columbine, Uvalde, uh, Las Vegas, Sandy Hook, the Orlando Pulse nightclub shooting, you know, various shootings that have happened at, at grocery stores, at Walmarts, um, elsewhere, churches. Uh, and so they, they occur at these various locations, schools, workplaces, movie theaters, malls, churches, government buildings, other public locations. There are certain types of mass violence that I'm not talking about today. So I'm not talking about shootings that occur solely in the home, like family killings, uh, or gang conflict, drug trafficking, robbery, burglary, or attack by violent groups, like by soldiers or paramilitary fighters or militias. Um, so it's like the battle at Wounded Knee, you know, or events that happened committed by Nazis during the Holocaust, you know, or acts of genocide, you know, which unfortunately happen all around the, the world. That's not the kind of violence I'm talking about today. I think we all know that, but it's important kind of from a methodological standpoint. These are incidents that are usually committed by an individual acting alone 95 to 98% of the time. And they're traditionally defined as incidents that result in four or more victims killed. You know, certainly all types of violence are worth stopping, um, but if you want to stop attacks like Columbine or Rivaldi, you need to focus on that when you're doing the research. Um, you can't assume that kind of all different types of crimes have the same root causes or the same solutions. Okay, I wanted just to provide a little bit of context for what um, Dr. Madfis mentioned on, on the frequency of these incidents in the United States. So I did a study of 171 countries from 1966 to 2012, and it was one of the first studies of its kind, and, and one of the major research questions was really simple, how often do mass shooters attack in various countries? And the key findings were essentially that the United States had roughly 30% of all public mass shooters during this period, despite having less than 5% of the world's population. And so, you know, don't worry, there's no kind of math quiz here, but, but if you just do kind of multiplication or division, depending on how you want to approach it, it would mean that we have approximately six times our share of mass shooters and more public mass shooters than any other continent except Asia. So we had more public mass shooters than all of Europe combined, all of um, Africa combined, more than all of South America or Oceania combined. And Asia had slightly more, all of Asia had slightly more than the United States, but they have 10 times our, our population. So, and, and as uh, Dr. Mathis mentioned, these results have been replicated using skeptics data. So there are some people who came out and said, oh, this can't be true. And, and I used their data to show that once you took out 
incidents that shouldn't be counted, like acts of genocide, which are a terrible problem, but a different problem, um, the United States has more of this problem. And then the next research question is what explains cross-national differences? Why do some countries have more public mass shooters than other countries? And you know, it's a tricky thing to study because when you wanna compare 171 countries, you want data that you have reliably for 171 countries. So there are some things that are easier to measure than others. What I can say based on the research I've done is that some of the key findings included that homicide rates, suicide rates, GDP and urbanization were not correlates or not explanations for why countries had more or fewer mass shooters. Another way of thinking about this is it's not that you find the most mass shooters in the most dangerous countries or the most suicide prone countries or the poorest countries or the least developed countries. Where you do find them is where they're the most civilian firearms. So civilian firearm ownership rates provided the best statistical explanation and the only one that's been found so far. Now, I, I wanna just kind of share a few things and if you can't even read that, except you can see the color red, that'll be enough and I'll guide you along the way. So for that first research question, how often do mass shooters attack in various countries, you know, one thing you can do is you can look at all the data, all the cases, but kind of a, a shortcut is just to look at some of the deadliest cases. And so after the Orlando Pulse nightclub shooting in, in 2016, you know, that shooting happened, it started around 2 a.m., you know, so it was like Saturday night, but 2 a.m., so it's Sunday morning. And so the later that day, the New York Times called me and asked me various questions about the context of this incident. And you see here down in real tiny little letters, that's my name, that's, uh, um, because I provided this data for them just to contextualize how the Orlando nightclub shooting at that time stacked up against other incidents around the world. And you see just in terms of the red, so it's like there's five cases as of that time on this list of the 15 worst, five out of 15 is you know one third. So that's just one way of kind of seeing how disproportionate the United States problem is. Now, of course, there have been other incidents since then, including the Las Vegas shooting, um, both in the United States and, and internationally that would now be on this list. So then to that next question, you know, what explains cross-national differences and how do civilian firearms factor in? This was a New York Times chart from, I think, 2018, where I provided them data from, from the overall study I did, and I'll kind of walk you through it. It says the United States has 270 million guns and had 90 mass shooters between 1966 and 2012. Now, when it says 90 mass shooters, it's using that very specific focused definition, right? Only looking at individuals who killed four more victims and only individuals who committed this specific type of public attack. Again, not family killers or, or people involved in gang conflict or things like that. Um, and of course, that's only through 2012. There've been unfortunately many more since then. But the contrast it's drawing is the United States had, tw and we actually have far more firearms now too, so the United States had 270 million guns and 90 mass shooters during this period. No other country in raw numbers had more than 46 million guns or 18 mass shooters. Visually, it's easy to appreciate because we have mass shooters on this axis and we have firearms, civilian firearms on this axis. And the United States, we're all up here by ourselves as an outlier, right? The bad kind of outlier in the upper right-hand corner. And then everyone else is down here in the lower left-hand corner. And I'll just call attention to the fact that like China and India, their populations are much larger than ours. So you would think in raw numbers, India could have a, a worse problem than us. Um, or actually, we could have a worse problem than India and they, their dot could be up here too, but they just have more people. So they would look similar until you adjusted for per capita. But so the fact that we're dwarfing them 
both in firearms and in mass shooters, and we have so fewer people, um, is particularly remarkable. Now, there's some more complexity here, and that's kind of what I wanted to talk about next. So I've done additional studies on mass shootings and firearms, and I think it's important to recognize that globally firearm ownership on the one hand and access on the other hand, they appear correlated. In other words, typically the countries where civilians own more firearms are also gonna be the countries where it's easier for civilians to access firearms, right? And so a good question here is which matters more, ownership or access and the ability to become an owner? Now, I used firearm ownership in that previous study just because those are the data that are available. Access is really hard to quantify. But results from my recent studies with co-authors suggest that most of the deadliest mass shooters, at least in the samples we've identified, most of the deadliest mass shooters in the US were not lifelong gun owners or hunters. In this one particular sample we found that was small, only 21% had been gun owners for more than three years before their attack. They weren't more likely to be gun owners than the average American male prior to getting the guns that they used for their attack, right? Obviously, they all possessed firearms eventually. And many obtained weapons only after they decided to commit a mass shooting. So at least my interpretation here is that the problem is access more than ownership, at least when it comes to mass shootings. In other words, typically these are premeditated crimes, so you see motive first, firearm second. And that's not necessarily true for all types of gun violence problems. So again, this is my interpretation. The problem isn't that owning a gun increases Americans' desire to commit mass shootings. The problem is that Americans who have the desire to commit mass shootings can easily access firearms, even if they've displayed serious red flags and warning signs. And I'll just pause here to make a little contrast. Again, we're talking about premeditated crimes, and in, in some of these cases, the perpetrators specifically want to kill a large number of victims. So they may not be attacking with the kind of gun that they have in their closet, right, even if they have one. Um, they are specifically arming themselves with military-type firepower to commit an especially heinous attack. Um, and so I think that's different than your typical crime of passion or, or road rage or suicide, right? In some of those cases, it, you know, criminologists sometimes say a homicide occurs if there's a gun too close and a hospital too far, right? Meaning that like, it can just happen like that. The person who commits murder sometimes calls 911 to report what they just did because they didn't know they were gonna do it until after it happened. But that's different than mass shootings, right? So, uh, you know, I'm not trying to say that gun ownership doesn't increase risks, but I, that's not exactly what I'm seeing with these mass shootings specifically. I don't think anybody's committing a mass shooting, a public mass shooting, because they just realized they had one in their desk drawer, a firearm in their desk drawer, and, and it just kind of like grew on them, right? Um, sometimes having that firearm in your desk drawer might lead to suicide or lead to a fist fight becoming homicide. So kind of thinking about to-do lists, like what can we do here um, on this firearm issue? Well, it depends kind of who you are and what your approach is, but I just wanted to outline some things. So look, if you're angry, I, I, I think treating gun owners like quote unquote the enemy may feel good, but I don't think it's, leading us in the right direction. So obviously mass shootings cannot happen without guns, right? And given the tragedy and the emotion involved, I think it's natural to look for someone to blame. But look, you know, 99.99% .99 of gun owners will never commit a mass shooting and most do want to prevent attacks and save lives. In fact, you know, part of the problem here, and we, we have some authors who tackle this in the book that, that Eric mentioned, is that 
many gun owners are seeking protection so they can feel safer. So you sometimes see mass shootings followed by increase in gun purchasing because there are people who think buying a gun will make them safer from the next mass shooting, right? And, and so the cycle escalates. Uh, a 2023 Pew Research Center poll found that 72% of gun owners in the United States cited protection as a major reason why they own firearms. So now I have kind of some interesting polls that I wanted to share with you, and I'll throw out a caveat. Um, I pulled three Fox News polls. Now I did that not because it's my go-to source for reliable information, um, but, uh, but I guess what I was looking for was if even these Fox News polls provide reason for optimism on finding a middle ground or making real progress, then that is exciting to me, right? Um, if even the Fox News polls suggest that Democrats and Republicans and gun owners and non-gun owners might agree on some things, well, now we're maybe really working with something if we take it in the right direction. Okay, so what, uh, Fox News poll. This is from April 21st to 24th, 2023. That's about a month after the Nashville um, school shooting of, of a year ago. Yes, concern that you or a loved one will be a victim of gun violence. So all respondents, 51% said yes. Gun owning households, 44% said yes. So that's pretty close. And then you see the, the other numbers as well. And so I find this interesting for a few reasons. One is because it shows the gap between people in general, Americans in general, and gun owners in terms of their concerns. That gap's not that big, right? We're kind of all afraid of some similar things, or at least a big chunk of us are all afraid of similar things. Um, Now, you could look at this and think, well, maybe owning a gun does make you feel a little safer, right? 44% is a little bit lower. I don't really wanna get into that because there's a lot of data that would say like, even if you feel safer for having a gun, doesn't mean you are safer, right? Um, but more broadly, I guess I'd say, look, it takes courage and maturity to seek a reasonable middle ground. And that's, I guess, what I'm trying to encourage people to do today. You know, I've, I've been interviewed on MSNBC News and on CNN and on Fox News, and I've been able to talk about support for various types of gun control on all three networks. And I feel good about that. You know, when I go on Fox News and have the host actually give airtime to talking about gun control, that's a step in the right direction. But I don't think we can get there without the, kind of the right level of maturity. Um, okay, now this is a little less promising. <laughs> uh, it's a bigger source of a, of a disagreement here. This is a poll, again, these are from the same time period, favor proposals to reduce gun violence. So we see big di disagreements here. Ban assault weapons. Overall, 61% of American respondents said yes, but there's a big split. 84% of Democrats said, Yes, ban assault weapons, only 36% of Republicans. And then the flip side is more citizens carrying guns. Would that be a good thing? Do you favor that? Overall, slightly less than half of Americans said yes, only 27% of Democrats, who are those 27%, I wonder, um, said more citizens carrying guns would be a good thing for the country, um, and 61% of Republicans said that as well. So. There are big disagreements here, and I think a natural thing, if you want to be pragmatic, is to say, why do we not start with the things we disagree with each other the most on and try to make progress in the areas where maybe there is, is an easier path to making progress? I guess I just also want to perhaps try to push back on perhaps an, a knee-jerk reaction to something like this. I don't think this poll shows that some people are smart and some people are dumb, um, which might be an easy kind of like pat yourself on the back for being part of the smart group reaction. Um, I think it's more complicated. And look, you know, 
people on both sides, they're mostly not doing the research themselves, right? We're, we're, most of us are too busy for that. So for the most part, people are relying on some level of common sense and data from people they trust. I also want to just say one other thing. So I'm not going to make some sort of argument for why we need assault weapons in the country. Um, but I'm coming from the University of Alabama, so, and I try to talk to people. And so here's an interesting thing that someone said to me. They said, well, you know, we could ban all cars that go more than 75 miles an hour. And we can make it so cars can't go accelerate fast, right? So they can't go zero to 60 in five seconds. And that would save lives. So why don't we do that? Um, someone, somewhere, I didn't sign on, someone said, well, you know, speed and power are cool and it's worth the cost of some lives, right? So I'm just giving you that example because, so they were saying, okay, ban fast cars and ban assault weapons, but don't take one approach to assault weapons and the other to the cars. I'm just pointing that out because I think there are intelligent people on, on both sides and, um, but frankly, I wouldn't even get into that argument here because there's much easier things to talk about. Proposals to reduce gun violence percent seeing favor. So these are things where they're, according to Fox News, who I would have assumed was gonna be polarizing, these are areas of agreement. Background check for guns. And, and some of these are shorter because they are trying to fit you know, the meaning into just a few words. Background checks for guns, 87% of Americans support. Enforce existing gun laws, 81%, really do a better job of it. Uh, legal age, 21, to buy all or any guns, 81%. Require some sort of mental health checks, 80%. Flag or red flag, um, people who are danger to self, it actually said, or others, 80%. Require 30 day waiting period, 77%. So, you know, I think we would see these and say, well, these should be nationwide then, right? You know, if there's so much support, why aren't they? Well, probably for some of the reasons that Dr. Madvis mentioned, lobbyists, the NRA, um, politicians not doing what their supporters want. But I also think the more we fight with each other, the less likely it is that we'll get these kind of things passed, right? So after Parkland, there was an NRA spokesperson who came out in support of red flag laws. And I think red flag laws are essentially these laws where it's like, if there's a glaring sign, let's make sure we, we take the firearms and prohibit purchase for someone who's a clear danger to themselves or others. You know, but then there started to be fear of red flag laws because like some guy would be a jerk on Twitter and people would say, hey, we need red flag laws to take his gun. And it's like, so when you start scaring people and say, who are gun owners and say, oh, we're just gonna take your guns for any reason because we don't like you or because you're politically incorrect or because you're a jerk, not because of the things that actually are the, the, the reasons why we'd be scared of you committing a mass shooting, um, or harming someone, then, then we get polarized again. So just to kind of summarize on this political point, if we knew we could only make progress by working together, not by defeating the other side, not by winning us winning and them losing, if the only way to make progress is working together and pressuring our political leaders, why would we ever antagonize the other side? Well maybe because of anger, um, which is reasonable. But I guess I would rather be productive than be indulging myself in being mad. Okay, I'm gonna move past firearms here and, and, and talk about culture. Only a little bit of, of some of the variables we talk about in terms of culture. So US fame seeking and capitalism. I'm sure many of you have noticed this, but increasingly in America, fame is viewed as the ultimate form of success. For many people, it is past wealth or money as a, as a form of currency or a form of, of prestige. And some examples of this, public polling from the past 10 to 15 years 
show that when children age 10 to 12 are asked about the most important thing for their future, their most common answer is to be famous. More middle school students say they would like to work as a famous celebrity's assistant than become a senator or a CEO. That's just being the assistant too, you know, um, getting coffee. 51% of Americans age 18 to 25 say that to be famous is one of their generation's most important goals in life. 50% of millennials say they believe their life should be made into a movie. And 15 to 20% of millennials say they'd give up having children, getting married, or ever interacting with their family again if they could be famous. You know, now, these are polls from the t past 10 to 15 years. My guess is, like, if you interviewed young people today, it would be worse. It would be more extreme. Um, but then also, like, some of these people are now in their 30s or early 40s, so that's not great either. <laughs> um, so not asked here, right, was would you kill for fame, right? But in a country of more than 300 million people, we know the answer is not 0%. So talking about consequences here, well, competition, competition for fame and attention leads to a blurring of the distinction between fame for good reasons and infamy for bad reasons. Many people say or do outrageous or immoral things to get attention because not everyone can, can win fame or attention through, through raw skill or talent. You know, this is especially obvious on social media, but, but certainly in other realms as well. And so what I'm building to here is, is that some mass shooters take the next logical or desperate step, which is killing for fame. Uh, much evidence, including some of the research that Dr. Madfis and I have conducted, uh, shows that the publicity mass shooters receive is dangerous for a variety of reasons. One, it encourages attention seekers to attack and then rewards them for mass murder. We have cases of mass shooters who started off as suicidal but made the calculation that if they die by suicide, no one would know who they are. If they die in mass murder suicide, they will have a legacy. It incentivizes, this publicity incentivizes attention seekers to kill large numbers of victims. It's not lost on the mass shooters themselves. Many of them have acknowledged it, that the more people they shoot, the more famous they'll get. That's a really bad incentive uh, system. This also helps explain why U.S. mass shootings have grown deadlier over time due to this competition for attention, even kind of among or between mass shooters. They're competing with each other, and, and sometimes they're using language talking about high scores or record setting. You know, and, and I have trouble not seeing this competition as kind of a, an offshoot of capitalism. It's just not for money alone. Um, and this publicity inspires contagion and copycat effects. In other words, high-profile mass shooters get famous, they become role models, and then they have followers, imitators, and copycats who commit mass shootings of their own. Now, kind of a, a concerning thing that ties this together is the exporting of America's mass shooting problem. So I did a recent study with a co-author, Jason Silva, and our research question was globally, who are mass shooters from 2000 to 2022 most likely to consider their role models? And we looked at American mass shooters and, and shooters from other countries. American mass shooters, perhaps not surprisingly, were three times more likely to have been influenced by another American mass shooter than by a mass shooter from all other countries combined. Meaning, when American mass shooters are committing copycat attacks, they have American role models. Now again, this might not surprise you, you know, a study by the Council on Foreign Relations says like Americans, in general, we don't have a ton of knowledge about world affairs and, and tend to be kind of inward looking. But when I'm talking about exporting, mass shooters in other countries we found were 50% more likely to have been influenced by an American mass shooter than by a mass shooter from all other countries combined. So meaning like a European mass shooter was more likely to copy an American mass shooter than to copy another European mass shooter. Same thing in Asia and elsewhere. And so a natural concern here is, are American mass shootings being quote unquote exported 
like other influential American products, McDonald's, Coca-Cola, things like that. I found this goofy little image. I don't know if that's supposed to be like McDonald's on Mars or, or what, you know, but, well, on the point of exporting, I, I guess I would say this, you know, we may get to a point where the share of all mass shootings worldwide, the US share has shrunk. That doesn't mean we made any progress, right? Because if you just think about it, like there was a time when 100% of McDonald's were in the United States and now it's far fewer, right? The, the percentage, right? Now if you say what percentage of all uh, McDonald's worldwide are in the US, I don't know, maybe it's 20%. Does that mean people are eating fast food less? No, it just means we sent, we set up shop everywhere else, right? And so we may see a change in the percentage of American mass shootings, but unfortunately we may be responsible for some incidents that are increasingly happening, happening overseas. This is a study I did called, Do the Media Unintentionally Make Mass Killers into Celebrities? an assessment of free advertising and earned media value. I just thought I'd read you a little bit from the abstract. This study compared perpetrators of seven mass killings from 2013 to 2017 with more than 600 American celebrities over the same time period. Findings indicate that mass killers received approximately $75 million in media coverage value. So if we just stop there for a second, that was seven incidents 75 million dollars in free advertising from the media so that's 10 million dollars roughly on average for these mass killings and free advertising now when we're talking about free advertising and putting a dollar amount it's kind of like is there like a tacoma newspaper okay so it's like if you want to pay to advertise in the tacoma newspaper you pay a lot less than if you pay to advertise on cnn at 6 p.m right so if you look at advertising rates, you can put dollar amounts on media coverage based on its prominence, and so that's what we did here. Then the second part is, during their attack month, some mass killers received more highly valued coverage than some of uh, the most famous American celebrities, including Kim Kardashian, Brad Pitt, Tom Cruise, Johnny Depp, and Jennifer Aniston. So what these data show is that, you know, if you say, mass shooters are being treated by the media like celebrities, that's not hyperbole, that's not an exaggeration. Um, we know celebrities have followers, right? Have imitators. Um, and so it's not surprising that mass shooters, although maybe adored by fewer people, um, also get followers and fans because of the media coverage they receive. Talk a little bit more about this. The FBI, more than 150 scholars and other experts have called for the media to change their behavior. Perhaps you've seen some of this. Um, so why do the media continue to reward mass shooters with free advertising? Now, Eric, uh, Madfuss and I have been directly involved in this. We published an open letter to the media with 150 signatures from criminologists, law enforcement experts, et cetera. And we published it, I think it was the day after the Las Vegas shooting in 2017. You know, so that's been, what, almost seven years. So what's going on, you know? And, you know, we both have interacted with the media a lot. Why is this still continuing to be a problem? Well, I just wrote three little things. Naivete, hubris, capitalism. I wrote naivete because I was like, I always like one word I can barely pronounce in a presentation. Um, <laughs> I don't think that is the answer, not anymore. Right? You'd really have to be the, the kind of ostrich with your head in the sand if you work in the media and have no idea that there's concerns about media coverage of, of mass shootings. Um, hubris, I, I do think there may be a little something to that. There may be some reporters or editors or journalists who say to themselves, eh, I know more than the FBI or I know more than criminologists about mass shooter psychology, and I know more what's best for America, and therefore we're just gonna publish this because it's the right thing to do. And then the third thing I have here is capitalism, right? I think there's no doubt that there are media companies that are profiting off their salacious coverage of mass shooters. And sometimes this is kind of rationalized 
because everybody wants to be able to sleep at night. And, but it's rationalized in a capitalist, competitive um, context because, it, because you may have a media company and you say, we need to survive. We're doing important work. We're covering politics, you know, we're covering the economy, we're, we're covering all sorts of social suffering. And if those people over there are being salacious in their coverage, we have to do it too. Now, you said there's like all sorts of like moral philosophy that would say that's bad or like what you teach your four-year-old would tell you that that's bad logic. I would agree with you, but I've heard that argument made to my face. Um, I wanted to give you an example of dangerous or reckless coverage. This is from the Washington Post front page of their website. Parkland suspect, so this is after the, the 2018 Parkland school shooting in which I believe 17 victims were killed and many more were shot. Parkland suspect detailed plans and chilling videos, I'm going to be the next school shooter. In the brief recordings, suspected gunmen, and then I just wrote, I put those little, you know, low tech green circles and ovals. I just put them in there, you know, for taste, I suppose. In the brief recording, suspected gunman, and then they named him, outlined his violent plans in grim detail and gloated about the notoriety he expected to gain. And now this picture, this is a picture of him from his own pre-attack cell phone video in which he referenced that he would be famous. Now, I gotta say, you know, even my undergraduate students immediately recognized the irony perhaps the hypocrisy that the Washington Post is publishing this article talking about the, notori the notoriety he expected to gain and they're giving it to him, right? And I don't think it's because there's a lack of intelligence there, um, but it's, it's pretty hard to defend. This was months after his attack, by the way. It's not like this is the breaking news coverage um, when his identity was, was unknown or perhaps of greater news interest. Another example, uh, this is from CNN's Twitter page. Now, I mentioned that I've been interviewed on CNN, so and now I'm criticizing CNN. You know, that, that is awkward, tough, right? Uncomfortable, maybe I'll never be on CNN again, and I'll live happily ever after, that's fine, you know? But, um, but my point is, like, you gotta decide, like, are you just, live, are you in it for yourself, or are you in it for more than that? Um, now, I scribbled out these two things as well. Now, the reason I scribbled out the name there is because the name of the father of the 2022 Highland Park shooter was also the name of, of his son. The father was a junior, the son was a third. So this is the, the attack that happened at that, outside the um, Chicago suburbs at a parade on July 4th. Um, the father confessed that the of the confessed shooter said he thought his gun was gonna use the guns he helped purchase at this shooting range. Well, I'll just not comment on that for now. Um, but what I will comment on is at the bottom, I just responded, CNN's audience is mad because they're publishing the Highland Park shooter's picture for no discernible reason other than clickbait. And then what I really love is how mad people were. Um, I like the outrage uh, because here I just gave you some examples I just you know, screen grabbed, I think, five of them. Why are you showing this little weasel's face? This is at CNN and at the reporter. At CNN, please stop. Take down his picture, CNN. Stop posting this murderous prick's picture. Please take his photo down and stop drawing attention to him. And you see these little, the little pink is because I went and loved every one of these. <laughs> um, so like, if the media is doing this for capitalist reasons, if they're trying to make a profit, you know, if they're trying to do this for clickbait, then like, please show them and encourage others to show them that they're alienating their, their customers and consumers. Um, I think that's the best way to force change at this point. So just in terms of kind of some obvious uh, to-do list on improving media and social media responses, I'd encourage you to support notor a no notoriety and these kind of don't name them, don't show them approaches. Uh, educate, encourage, pressure, and or shame others to do the same. You know, we can discuss important details as I have this entire presentation and as our other speakers will today as well without using mass shooters' names and images. 
you know, I, I actually just ran numbers because I was curious. And if you look at most media articles, if you just took out the perpetrator's name and wrote the, you know, the 2018 Parkland shooter or something, 98% um, of the articles unchanged, completely unchanged. Now, just emphasize, like, confronting the media or friends or family who use social media, if you, you, you see them doing something that's irresponsible, um, can re require courage and tact, too. I think this conversation needs to be repeated again and again, um, especially when you see things that are dangerous. Further reading, I'm just going to mention a little bit about this book, but, but I'm also kind of aware, I'm aware, I guess, of um, capitalism, right? So here's what I would say. So in case people are interested, the book that Eric uh, mentioned, I just want to tell you a little bit, bit about it. Edited book, 23 chapters by other scholars besides us with various areas of expertise. There are a bunch of other cultural factors that I couldn't touch on today. Masculinity, racism, politics, um, education, more about gun culture, mental health that is touched on in the book by other people writing besides us. Um, I didn't really want to pitch it, so I just put these two quotes. One's from the Senior Director of Research for Every Town for Gun Safety. Book is a sober but deeply worthwhile read. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's not a fun subject. Uh, and we have a, a nice quote there from the director of the Mahatma Gandhi Center for Global Nonviolence. Now, I guess I would just, last thing I'd say is, you know, I'm not pushing this book for capitalist reasons, right? Uh, Eric and I aren't making significant money um, if you buy a copy. So just to prove that I'm being genuine, please feel free to steal a copy or buy one copy and share it with 50 of your friends, okay? All right, uh, thank you very much.